Well, hi folks, we're starting just a minute early just to make sure we have our camera working this time. So we'll pan around the museum for a second for you before we start. We're all okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome back, folks, for our second installment of the Historic Wendover Airfield's live history lessons. Now, as we go, we're still working out some of our technological kinks, so hopefully you can hear us. We hope to try to incorporate some better microphones in the future, but we're not quite there today. Um, but I'm Landon Wilkie. I'm the museum curator here. I'm... Happy to have you. Um, so again, as we go along, today we're going to be talking about um, aerial gunnery training, because that has actually a lot to do with Wendover, as you'll learn. But as we go along, feel free to ask questions that are particularly applicable to the topic, and we can answer those as we go along. And afterwards, we'll do a short question and answer period. So, I mean, if you have any questions about the base, about our history, about the Army Air Force, um, let us know and we'll see what we can do. And afterwards, any questions that are in the comments, we will <laughs> um, try to answer those as we go along throughout the rest of the week. But we hope you're home, safe, and healthy. So, we will begin. We're going to talk about why aerial gunnery was needed at first. So we're going to have Jim, our cameraman, zoom in here. We're going to see if this video will show up a little bit for you. But this gives you an idea of what bombers were facing at the time for America's strategic bombing campaign. Once it plays. So hopefully you saw just how fast those aircraft were actually moving. Imagine trying to hit that from a moving platform at airplanes going, you know, 300 miles an hour. That was the gunner's job. The United States Army Air Force at the beginning of the war had some of the best aircraft, um, B-17s and B-24s, and with these they said, we're going to practice strategic daylight bombing. Now originally the British had tried daylight bombing and they were absolutely slaughtered by German forces because of course they're dead meat for fighter aircraft everyone can see them and can easily attack them so that's why the British switched to nighttime area bombing but the United States particularly because we had this piece of technology the Norden bomb site which we'll talk about in a future installment we said we're going to fly in daylight we're going to fly over enemy lines and hit enemy infrastructure um, military targets and anything else that we think will help bring the enemy to their knees. And because we are using such a uh, specialized and precise device, we're also going to cut down on civilian casualties. That was the United States' belief going into this. And we had such terrific bombers prior to the war, we thought enemy fighters aren't going to be the biggest problem either. Well, we realized we were wrong, especially the Germans as well as the Japanese had developed aircraft that could easily catch and outfly our bombers. So that's why these planes were armed to the teeth with typically 50 caliber machine guns. So let me grab this for you. Here's our model of a B-17 with a cutaway. So you can see we have guns up front. So we have guns up front in the nose that the bombardier is going to control. We have the flight engineer working in the top turret. We also have here in the radio room another 50 caliber machine gun coming out of the dorsal of the aircraft. We have two waste gunners 
And then here in the tail, we have our tail gunner with two 50 caliber machine guns. And then as we roll the plane up, you can see this poor guy who's stuck in the ball turret, kind of that Star Wars looking device, but he can swing around with a 360 degree view of everything below him, and he's their only defense going up. So these guys, I got the top oh, turret. Got, oh, yep. I didn't focus on the top turret. <laughs> but you can see again, we mentioned this last week, but these planes really are just aluminum cans filled with men and bombs. So these guys don't have much protection. They're not comfortable. But here they are in their heavy flying clothing to stay warm and being able to manipulate these guns and defend the bombers. So these guys are typically shooting 50 caliber bullets. They're typically being shot at by up to 20 millimeter cannons that some of the German aircraft had, as well as some of these 40 millimeter anti-aircraft um, munitions that you can see. So that kind of pales in comparison, but that's what they had to try to keep the bomber force going. So the reason why we're talking about aerial gunnery for Windover is Windover actually had, in addition to the base, its own aerial gunnery school. So we'll try some of these pictures here. So soon after the base officially opened in March of 1942, um, the Army Air Force asked Windover, and in particular Colonel Dippy, who was the commander of the base, if he could set up an aerial gunnery school. Oh, and by the way, we don't actually have funds appropriated for you to do this, but if you could do that as quickly as possible, that would be fantastic. So this is an overview of what our um, gunnery range looked like with this facing kind of to the northwest up a mountain gully just a few miles outside of town. But all along the base, once they got it up, which took about, even though they didn't have the funds, they had the majority of it set up within three weeks. So the main individual who was in charge of this operation, his name was Captain William Keyes, and he was the commander of our bombardment and gunnery range. So there's a moniker that um, Captain the that Captain Keyes has, which is Captain Keyes and his 30 or 40 thieves, something like that. Because as he was trying to um, kind of reappropriate items around the base and around the surrounding areas, he was taking everything he could to get this base going. So any trains that stopped through town, they probably wouldn't make it to their final destination with everything that was intended for their official recipient. They were pulling things off. So it was said that if you left anything around base, that could be a fatal mistake because Captain Keyes and his men would swoop it up and they would take it out to the hills to assemble their gunnery range. And what they did was actually amazing. So here is, is an actual aerial picture of this. So these are all barracks that they had set up. Originally they went to Salt Lake City and deconstructed some CCC um, camp barracks and brought them back here to reconstruct. Then we have an assortment of turrets. We have moving target ranges. And a lot of this was on the forefront. They came up with it themselves. And actually the Army Air Force said, Wow, what you're coming up with is amazing. We might try to incorporate some of this into our training elsewhere. So that's why aerial gunnery training is so important to Windover. So let me see where we're at. Yeah. So to kind of illustrate what life was like, especially for one of these early um, gunners in training, I want to talk a bit about um, John T. Brinkman. So he was actually with our first contingent, the 306th Bomb Group, that came through Windover for bomber training early in 1942. So being one of the early guys to actually go to the gunnery school, it had just barely been kind of finished. They still had work to do. They showed up and he said, are those our barracks? And they were told, no, you're gonna have to go get yours. So they actually took a trip across a couple states through Nevada and up into Idaho to the Snake River and they actually picked up some additional CCC camp buildings, deconstructed them, brought them back on six by six trucks all the way through that spring cold weather. I mean, these guys were in the back of trucks exposed, but they brought those back to camp, they built up those structures, and that's what they were living in. Um, <clears throat> so something else. So 
When John graduated from high school, he was 17 years old, and he managed to sneakily enlist anyway. So there was his first problem, though they never act, though he had already finished a tour of duty before anyone found out he was only 17. Um, another problem he had is he was six foot one inches, and at that time the aerial gunnery schools you couldn't be more than six feet tall. But he managed to get a waiver, and being the tall guy, somehow he ended up being a ball turret gunner once he actually got put with his crew. So figure that out. But he served an amazing tour of duty and had some terrific stories. So we're going to try to get his oral history and some of his other information out there. But we wanted to share his story because he's a major donor and supporter. He actually helped get this building constructed, which is why it's called the Senior Master Sergeant John T. Brinkman Service Club, which is where the museum is now. So he had terrific stories, like one meal was consisted of four types of beans, and that was all they had. Um, they still didn't have quite all the facilities they needed, so they were using a slit trench up there at the gunnery school. So that means they would fill in one end as it got kind of full with refuse, and they would keep digging out the rest. So they just made it work up here at the gunnery school. So we're going to get into a little more what aerial gunnery school consisted of. Now first of all this was going to be a lesson in how to fire pretty much all of the Army Air Force's weapons that were used in the defense of aircraft. So that's why it was actually called flexible aerial gunnery school. This idea that these are um, moving armaments and that you might be serving in different positions as well. So one of the early do or one of the early tasks that these gunners had to do involved aircraft recognition. So all over the base they were constantly swarmed with um, training exercises to make sure that when they were in the air they could recognize right away what kind of aircraft these were. So a couple of ways they did this, we'll pan over here on the table. <clears throat> we have... Are, are you going to try to get them to guess what it is? Sure! <laughs> So one thing that most people have probably seen if you've studied anything about aerial gunnery is ID recognition cards for these aircraft. Sometimes they were on the back of playing cards so they could always be training. In this case, this is just a deck of flashcards that have information about the planes and the silhouettes. So if anyone is watching and wants to shout out in the comments as we go along what some of these aircraft are, let us know. But this is what these guys were training with. They would have carried these in their pockets at all times and been studying up. So we have that one. Let's try that one there. And so not only do they have to be able to recognize enemy aircraft, but they have to be able to recognize friendly aircraft too, both of their own country and of other nations, allied nations. I don't know if we're getting any responses, but I guarantee those of you out there watching this probably already have a pretty good idea of what a lot of these are. But these guys were constantly training, so it, in addition, here we have more of a Spitfire type aircraft, but this was just used so they could learn different parts of the plane. So here I'll give this one away, our ME or BF-109 Messerschmitt, which was one of the common German fighters at the time. But here on the back of the card, you can see it has um, dead giveaways for this type of aircraft. So angular wingtips sweep back and tapered, wings tip square and E rounded in F. So it's telling them different variants of the aircraft. So all the time these guys are working on this. Another thing that Windover was noted for by the Army Air Force is one of the buildings where the airmen tended to have to wait on while, um, during their training they actually installed up in the ceilings um, moving model aircraft so that they could stand there and watch actually in movement from different angles and have to identify these aircraft. So they got real handy. They'd always be carrying around something to study, whether it was for identification or later on as they got into training, how to assemble weapons and what that consisted of. So there you can see they pretty well covered every aircraft that might have been flying at the time. So if you saw our advertisements, you probably recognize this picture. 
but these are a lot of the models that you would see around the base. These were used for recognition, and in this case he's actually using them to show if a plane is attacking from this angle, what guns are going to be able to hit it, how they're going to hit it, what they need to do to do that. So this is kind of the classroom setting for these guys. And of course Windover was miserable because it was either hot in these buildings, or in the winter they had these coal stoves and they were probably miserably cold. So, But they kept on going. That was the important part. So there we can see they're showing how and when to um, fire at targets using the crosshairs. So another method that, or another training method they, they had to do was to um, disassemble and reassemble their 50 caliber machine guns. And then once they got good enough, they actually had to do it with a blindfold. You can see this gentleman right here is doing that right now. And to make it even harder, they had to name every single part, over 225 parts in a machine gun, as they assembled this blindfolded. And our fastest time by Staff Sergeant Byron Dugat, who was actually one of our gunnery instructors, it was 4 minutes and 52 seconds. He set the record here in Wendover, at least by 1942. So these guys knew everything about their weapons. And just to get them familiar, if they weren't already, they were working with, they would kind of work up in size. So on this end, you can see they're actually working with some smaller carbines. And then they move up to 30 caliber machine guns, which they were using out on the ranges a lot. And this guy on the end, you can see the size difference. We have a 50 caliber machine gun. And so this is actually on our south base here. And what they were firing at was a moving target. And the way that Wendover devised these moving targets was to have a jeep that was mounted on a track. So it had about a foot tall board and it would be guided along there. So fortunately this guy just had to start the jeep and get out of there. He wasn't going to be sitting behind this berm as guys were shooting at this target on top of it. So this same system was used all throughout our aerial gunnery school up on the mountain on those different ranges. And all of them had different shapes and different elevations. So no matter where it was on the track, these guys were learning a new area of deflection, which was something we'll talk about here in a second. So <clears throat> in addition to learning with these smaller guns, they had all sorts of other methods that came for simulated training. Um, they developed um, camera guns, so they would actually go up an aircraft with these camera guns and instead of bullets it was shooting film so that their instructors after the flight could actually review that film and see if they would have actually been hitting the target. So that was a lot of film to sort through, so it was not the best method, but it did work. Um, something else they came up with was photoelectric cell um, guns, so if you've been to any carnival, a lot of those um, games they're playing might actually have systems like those. They also had just BB guns, compressed air BB guns, and supposedly once these guys went to town for R&R &R after finishing gunnery school, they would go and show off to the girls by heading over to the carnival tents and popping down all the tin targets. So these guys got very skilled at the craft of shooting any type of weapon. So as they moved up in size, they also had to learn how to use the different systems on an aircraft. So this is actually a group of men on one of our um, Sperry ball turrets. That's the um, turret that would be hanging out of the bottom of a B-17 or a B-24 Liberator. So these guys had to be familiar with them before they went to combat. So here you can see this guy just popping his head out. And that is the underside. So he actually has that full rotational axis like he would in the aircraft. So most of these turrets were hand operated. They would have kind of handlebars and you would just pressure it one way or the other to turn and you would pressure it up or down to actually lift or lower the guns. So to get handy at using these turrets, um, something that Captain Keys and his men also came up with, you can't really make it out in this picture, but there are several circular buildings. So here on base, maybe we'll go over to our map here for a second. We have a series of ordnance bunkers. So these are um, concrete semicircles that are out there and then covered in dirt. So these are just a lot of mass so that 
whatever ordnance is stored in here, like ammunition or bombs, should it explode or detonate, it's not going to go too far. So because these forms are semicircles, Captain Keyes said, hey, can I use your wooden forms that they used to set up the concrete and actually take them out here to the gunnery range? So he would put two halves together and he actually had a circular building. They just had to roof it. And so inside of one of these circular buildings would be the mounted turret. And these guys, that's where they would learn how to actually manipulate the systems and make it work. Um, typically they would shine a light somewhere on the wall or they would actually move it around, whether in a figure eight circle or just all around the building so that these guys were figuring out what pressure was needed to get the gun to where it needed to be as fast or slow as possible. So the fact that they came up with all this themselves is astounding. But again, so here's one of the turrets that you'll find in the nose or tail of a B-24 also mounted out there. So we can see some of those B-24 turrets. Down in the ground we actually have steps that lead down into these upper turrets. The guy will walk down the stairs and pop his head up into those. And then on the end we have some of those Sperry ball turrets. So these guys are actually shooting at these moving target ranges that are controlled by the jeeps behind a berm. So these guys, currently they're just in a fixed position, firing their turrets, getting real familiar with it. And then the next step that Windover came up with was called the Tokyo Trolley. So this was an innovation of our own. This is um, basically an old mine cart or a hand cart, just something, just a small train car. And so on top they have mounted three 30 caliber machine guns. You can see the innovation. The instructor here actually is sitting in a seat that's backed by a five gallon Pepsi can syrup um, piece. So they really did cobble all of this together. But what they used the Tokyo trolley for is this went back and forth in kind of a semi-circle semi at the top of the gun range. And it could go up to 40 miles an hour. And so meanwhile, they're shooting at these other moving targets that can move up to about 20 miles an hour. So now they're actually firing from a moving platform at a moving target. So that was the closest we could get in Windover to simulating aerial combat short of sending airmen up in a plane. So most gunnery schools actually would require that, that um, these gunners would get in the back of something like a T6 Texan that had a machine gun, and they would go and shoot at a target sleeve. Let's see. So here's the actual target banner or sleeve, and then here's a poor, these are actually women Air Force service pilots that are flying this aircraft. They're lucky enough to be fired at by live ammunition and hoping that these airmen are accurate enough to hit the banner back here. But airmen would come up here and fly parallel to this aircraft and they would shoot their 50 caliber to practice lead on the target. Um, <clears throat> and so to actually evaluate how they did, each different gunner would have his own bullets painted in a different color and they would leave that mark on the sleeve. So when this plane landed, their instructors could look at that and see how many hits um, they actually had. So we do have an example of one of these tow winches just to show you. So they would just connect the banner to this hook here and they would release that winch in flight and off that banner would go and give them a target to hit, hopefully far enough from the airplane. But something interesting about this duty is it was often fulfilled by women Air Force Service pilots or also by the Civil Air Patrol. The military didn't want to expend any of their valuable military pilots, so they were sending up women and civilians to actually do some of this work. So you can imagine how dangerous that could have been with the risk of friendly fire. But once they had completed all that, they were pretty well situated in learning how to use a 50 caliber machine gun. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So these two machine guns that we'll see here were actually recovered from a B-17 crash, a B-17 that came from Windover Army Air Base. Um, they crash landed on a ranch west of here that was managed by a guy named Bill Wright. So he actually helped with the recovery effort of um, the air crew and these weapons in particular. So for a while, one of these was actually buried in the dirt out in the desert for a long time until someone went back and recovered it. 
But you can see the size of these things. So a B-17 Flying Fortress by the end of the war had 13 of these just to try to bring enough firepower to take out or scare off any enemy fighters. But to feed these big machine guns, these 50 calibers fire over 800 rounds a minute. And what these guys were taught was, well, one of the main things they had to learn when firing these machine guns was how to shoot it like a rifle, not like a fire hose. Typically, they were instructed to do more, no more than a two-second burst, because within that time, you've probably shot about 30 rounds of ammunition. Um, so that's why we have these huge cases of 50 caliber ammunition. These are kind of the typical ones you would have seen in a plane where they could grab extra ammunition. So this carries 240 rounds in belts, similar to this one, wherever the end is. So you can see that. Then on the aircraft, they would actually have different types of feeding boxes. So this is called a Type 01 ammunition box. So this could hold only 30 rounds, and typically this was mounted right onto the machine gun. This is one that actually would have been mounted in another picture right there next to it. So you can see that would be about two seconds of holding down the trigger. So this isn't typically what was used in combat. They actually had large boxes that would span kind of some of the fuselage of the bomber just to hold hundreds and hundreds of rounds for these guys. And then they always had some backups so they could refeed their guns. Something else about 50 caliber ammunition was the use of tracers. So we can see on this one, every one of those painted tips signifies a tracer, so every five rounds. So that way, when that's fired, it actually releases or burns off some calcium that is inside of that bullet. So even in daytime, you can see where that bullet is going. And since those are firing so fast, you have basically a constant line of sight and reference. So that's why tracers were so valuable to these guys. And then, so we kind of talked about different sizes, and here's one more. This holds 105 rounds, and this is something that's a bit easier to heft around. Just have that latch there. Pull the ammo belt out and feed it into the gun. But these are not light things. This spam can here, which is called a spam can because it was sealed in metal and they had to cut that away to actually access the bullets that protected them during shipping. But one of these spam cans weighs 101 pounds. So you don't want to have to be hefting too many of those around there. But that gives you an idea of the type of metal they're shooting. So one other thing we'll show you here. This is a Sperry K-13 com compensating gun sight. So inside of here is actually a <clears throat> gyroscope so it can track the movement of the aircraft or the gun so that helps it sight in on the target. But it's using this eyepiece here. It actually illuminates this with an aiming reticle or those crosshairs so it lights up on that display there. And then as they're looking out into the sky they just have to turn these dials it's already calculated to the airplane's um, airspeed, and then they just have to turn these dials so that that aiming reticle matches the wingspan of the approaching aircraft, and then it will help start tracking it and tell them the lead that they need to actually shoot in front of that plane so that it flies into the bullets. So gunnery really was a series of mathematics, figuring out how to lead a target, what the deflection was. So that is taking into account your own movement, the movement of the enemy aircraft, and where you need to be firing so that everything will come together, really. So it's amazing how they did it. So there was one quote I wanted to share with you, talking as we get into this, by John T. Brinkman. He said in an interview, he was asked uh, if he wore a parachute in the ball turret, because of course these guys got shot down a lot, they had a lot to be concerned about. And he said, absolutely not, you carried the parachute outside beside the ball, and my instructions to everyone on the crew, quote, if you leave that airplane, the minute I see that chute open, I'm gonna kill ya, I'm gonna kill ya, because you left without telling me, and I was serious about that. 
I don't know whether you understand that. So he had a unique position being in that ball turret there. Oftentimes he actually needed assistance to get that ball rotated to the right, spa um, right spot so he could climb out of that. So he's just saying if he saw his guys going down in parachutes and he wasn't told that they were bailing out and the plane is going down, he would understandably be a little upset. Um, so such was the life of a gunner. They never knew what was going to happen up in the air. So Wendover, once we had all this figured out, we graduated our first gunnery class in July of, or on July 31st, 1942. So at the time, this was the largest mass graduation and mass promotion of any Army Air Force gunnery school at the time, and one of the largest mass promotions for the Army at the time. Let me grab this book for it. But at this ceremony, Major General Robert Olds, who was the commander of the Second Air Force at the time, which incorporated Windover Army Air Base, he said, The mighty bombers were useless unless you gunners take them there and get them back. If the gunners fail, the flying missions fail with them. So that really stresses the importance of these gunners keeping these bombers safe. So upon graduation, they received their aerial gunnery certificate. This here is um, Staff Sergeant. That was his promoted rank. That was for all these 144 men um, to say that he completed Wendover Aerial Gunnery and Fire Control School. So this is a pretty special piece of paper. And we do have a few examples of those for different airmen who trained here. So if you are one of those who had a relative or you yourself served here, we'd love to get a copy or some recognition of that. And we also have, of course, the aerial gunnery wings. So this was the proudest moment as they got to pin these on their uniform. They were now officially part of the air crew. They were qualified and they were ready for combat. So... By the end of the war, over 297,000 airmen had qualified as gunners. Because not only were the career gunners, these guys who were assigned to one of these turrets being trained, but also people like the bombardier, the flight engineer, the navigator, the radio operator. Typically, they all had to take this six-week course to be um, sufficient in firing these guns because they all had double duty. But that almost 300,000 airmen, that was more um, qualified than in any other specialty in the Army Air Force except for maintainers. Because of course we had a lot of planes being shot up and they had to be taken care of. But you can get an idea of what these guys went through, especially those who set up the Windover Aerial Gunnery School. It was just incredible. The fact that, first of all, they spent actually their first two weeks here on construction detail, erecting their own school, and then they spent another six weeks getting everything together and learning what they needed to do to survive in combat. So, hopefully you learned something today. If you have any questions, let us know, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Yay!